Hello, this is Jonathan from Robotis, presenting an episode of Robotis Talks. Today, I'll be interviewing Samantha Johnson, the founder and CEO of Tatum Robotics, a cutting edge assistive robotics company. Samantha, if you'd like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the good stuff that you guys are doing over at Tatum. Absolutely, thank you for having me today. As you mentioned, I am the founder and CEO of Tatum Robotics. Tatum Robotics is an assistive technology company aimed at creating the first independent communication tool for people who have concurrent deafness and blindness. So because they cannot hear or see, they communicate through tactile signing. Tactile signing, as you could imagine, is a form of sign. So instead of visual sign language, the deafblind people actually hold on to the hands of their communication partners and receive the signs through that feel. So right now, because of that interaction with their communication partner, they don't have independent access to communication. So what we're developing is actually a robotic arm that the deafblind people hold on to to receive the signs. So what that ends up looking is like a highly anthropomorphic collaborative robotic hand wrist device with 18 degrees of freedom that will take in any form of English media, whether that be emails, news, books, and translates that into tactile sign for those deafblind receivers. I mean, that's a really important problem you're tackling and uh, something that is going to improve uh, a vast amount of lives significantly. Um, would you mind talking about what inspired you to work in this research? Yeah. So I actually started this as my master's thesis during my time at Northeastern University. During my undergrad at Northeastern, I had taken an American Sign Language class. And part of the class was to go out into the deaf community and learn more about the culture, practice your signing. And on one of those outings, I met a deaf blind woman and began chatting with her through tactile signing and started to learn more about the lack of communication options for deafblind folks. And the woman I was chatting with pretty much told me if there's not a person directly next to her, she's unable to communicate with them. And later when I started my thesis, it was actually during the COVID pandemic. And as you can imagine, that really exacerbated this problem for these people who relied so heavily on sense of touch. So I began collaborating with the deafblind contact center, which is that group that the woman who I'd met years prior was a part of and started forming some early prototypes and spun out into the company right after graduation a couple years ago. Well, that's interesting. Um, would you mind me asking, are you a roboticist by training? So I did both my undergrad and my graduate in bioengineering. I had taken signing classes just as part of an elective. So although not a robotics major, it was something that I had kind of studied mechanical design, electrical components kind of throughout my education and pulled it all together in my master's thesis there when I started designing the robot arm. Oh, wow. Um, would you be able to walk us through a little bit of how sort of all of your knowledge came together to put this together? Because it seems like a very complex device that emulates very complex human motion. You're absolutely correct. So it was something that as I got started, it definitely I started at a much smaller scope than what we're looking at now. So as I got started, one of the main things I was focusing on was really that kind of biomimicry aspect of it. I really wanted it to move and feel like a human hand. So something I was prioritizing, in especially the early stages, was trying to identify, you know, the amount of degrees of freedom that we needed, pulling in my background in, you know, musculoskeletal design and looking at materials that we could use, looking at kind of that biomaterials background of maybe that were kind of flexible zero things or TPUs that we could pull together. And really it wasn't until we kind of had those early prototypes of the, the mechanical design that we, we could really start pulling in together that multifunctional aspect of starting to add our embedded systems, pull together that software to pull, to develop our own custom APIs and databases for our full signing data sets. So it's a project that started at a smaller scale so that we could begin prototyping and getting that critical feedback from deafblind folks. As you can imagine, deafblind folks are not people who have been designed for customarily in the past. So pretty much every step of the design process was needed to be validated by the deafblind folks in the Boston community and beyond. So when we started making those material suggestions, we had deafblind folks from that deafblind contact center coming in, giving us their feedback. And as we started just figuring out how many degrees of freedom each finger, the wrist needed to have, it was that feedback that we pulled in. So at this point, our team is very multifaceted. As you mentioned, we have software engineers, hardware engineers, we have mechanical engineers, we have embedded systems. We also have linguists on our team to pull together that translation aspect. So it's something that requires a lot of hands on deck, but in the end, it creates a really holistic product that seemingly 
really checks a lot of the boxes for their communication needs for the deafblind folks. Uh, you mentioned uh, that one of the things is that oftentimes uh, deafblind folks aren't really designed for, and I would imagine in the case of something like this, that's even more paramount, especially since uh, one of the foremost concerns for robotics and especially anything dealing with humans, cobots, things like that, uh, safe safety issues are paramount. And I can imagine that not having the same sense of uh, in the environment that we do for deafblind folks, safety is a huge concern for something where you're essentially holding a robot in your hand. Uh, can you tell me how you tackled that? Yeah, and that's something that, as you can imagine, these are folks who can't hear or see the device moving. They don't have familiarity with technology, or as you can imagine, collaborative robotics and the standards around them. So it's something that when we were designing both the you know back-end software, but also the front and mechanical design, we wanted to make sure that above all safety was the priority. And that's something why we wanted to make that whole hand where the deaf and people are in contact with, we wanted to make that made of as many flexibles as possible. We wanted it to be inherently compliant. So even if you know the motors malfunctioned or the code sent the wrong commands, it's something that the deaf and people can't get hurt while using. And this was played a huge factor into the actuators that we were trying to select as well, because even though a lot of current robotics really goes down this space of very few degrees of freedom, very minimal actuation, but really high grip force tends to be where a lot of robotic design is heading towards. But we want to do almost the opposite. We want to have a highly dexterous hand with almost no grip force is what we want. And so as we were selecting servos or steppers or DC motors, it was something that you really ended up being a trade-off. You were either getting really high speeds or high, you know, or minimal compliance. So it's something that we were really excited when the XC product line came out from Dynamixel because it was something that we could really start controlling that current to make sure that, you know, if there was now a load of person's hand in between, the motors could tell us that and we could adjust the trajectories. So once we were able to really fine tune the design, we could then look into fine tuning that software infrastructure using the embedded kind of circuitry of the Dynamixels to make sure that we had a lot of control over the safety of the device. I can imagine that not being uh, primarily robotics focused, the ease of use of the Dynamixel system also came in handy, you probably sped up a little bit of that early development cycle as well, I would imagine. Yeah, and especially, just as you mentioned, that's where we wanted to really do a lot of rapid prototyping. And that's something that, you know, if I need to build out custom encoders and gearboxes, that really doesn't lend itself to that, especially when we're in the early stages that we don't know the torque requirements of our system. We don't know a lot of those variables that need to go into those designs. So by having the Dynamax infrastructure, even in those stages, just using a U2D2 to play within the wizard of does this work for our requirements? What are the settings that are variable that could be beneficial to us as we start implementing these into the system? And now as we bring on, we're a growing team, as we bring on new engineers, it's a really easy learning curve because it is such an easy interface to work with the servos that we have co-ops come in, we have new engineers, we even have students come in that are able to work with our device because of that ease of use of that system. Uh, to go back to something that you mentioned earlier, uh, you were talking about the importance of the uh, anthropomorphism of your design and that focus on dexterity as opposed to grip force. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit more about that? Because I can't imagine that it's easy to accurately reproduce some of the movements of a human hand. Most uh, platforms that I've seen with a similar form factor are significantly more limited in dexterity. Yeah, so that was something that we really couldn't compromise on because the hand shapes needed for American Sign Language are so specific. It was something that we couldn't just have a five degree of freedom hand and all the joints move at the same time. It was something that we needed to have control over. So the way we actually went through this design process was actually started with one degree of freedom per hand, per finger. What hand shapes could be accomplished, which could we not, and started adding in degrees of freedom so that we could still minimize the complexity of the design by having the minimum degrees of freedom that we could while still achieving all those hand shapes. And as you mentioned, the profile is essential because these deafblind folks are holding on to the back of it. It's not just that they're watching it, so it could just kind of look like a human hand. It needed to also feel like one, which is where those flexibles come in. But the way that we were able to accomplish that really small form factor with this really high degree of freedom is by having a tendon-driven system. So that's something that using those Dynamexels, we were able to add a very simple pulley design and really maintain that complexity of our system, but also at a low cost still too. It was something that 
we didn't need to keep all of the motors in the hand itself, have a really high payload at the end. Again, that safety factor of deafblind folks holding on to it is something that we could have a really dexterous system and have the motors in a remote area, but having the required torque, the required current load that we needed while still maintaining this very anthropomorphic system. As this technology has been advancing, uh, I imagine you've been doing a lot of testing and things like that. Uh, would you mind sharing some of the feedback that you've received from the DeafBind community? Yeah, that's probably the most fun part of my job. And I would probably say my team's favorite part as well is that we really are in constant collaboration with DeafBind folks, whether they're DeafBind folks who've been with us for years as we've had early stage prototypes and really being able to see their excitement each time they come in and can really see the improvements that we're making to deafblind folks that have are new using the device for the first time and seeing that excitement in their eyes for seeing the possibility of this communication tool. So at this point, we've probably tested with about 30 deafblind folks. So whether they come to our office here at Mass Robotics in Seaport, or we can travel, we go to you know Connecticut, New York, Florida, so that we can get some other deafblind people's hands on the device as well. And it really is very exciting to get their critical feedback on the design and also the use cases of it. It was actually really interesting when I first started this, I thought really that priority should be on making it feel like a human hand, not just in its movement patterns, but really kind of adding like a silicone skin to it. And when I added the silicone skin, the deafblind users where they didn't even want to touch it. They thought it felt like a monster. And that was feedback that I wouldn't even, I would not have ever assumed as you know, a hearing sighted engineer. And it was something that we needed their feedback for. So each time we bring in deafblind people, we learn so much about the needs and uses of the device. One of our most recent validations, we used to, we have a motor that's used for the rotation of the arm. And we, we had it just kind of basic geared and the deaf blind person came and put a lot of weight on the device and kind of just overheated the motor. And we had never had that problem in house because we knew how to hold the device and we knew what that limitation was. But now that we've learned that this could be a potential issue, we're able to redesign for that. So we try to get as many unique people to really people that are old, people that are young, people that are familiar with tactile signing, people that are new to tactile signing, so that we can really start, try to understand what those extremes are and really try to make sure that as much of it is designed for as possible so that this is the easiest for them to kind of learn and pick up on for their use. I'm glad that you're taking all this feedback into consideration. I'm sure the fact that not only are you designing something that has never been done before to assist the deaf blind community, but the fact that you're so responsive is a big part of your success in this field. It's definitely something we, we can't do alone. I can imagine. Um, before we head out, um, would you like to share some advice or any input on somebody who'd be interested in pursuing a career in robotics or perhaps other uh, fields of assistive technology? Yeah, I would say one of my favorite things is really been learning what you can do with robotics. I think when I entered the robotics field, it was almost a means to an end for me. I knew what I wanted to make. I knew I wanted to make a tool for deafblind folks and robotics was the key to get there. And throughout the past few years, I've learned so much about really the capabilities that we can do now. I could enter this space as not even an experienced roboticist and with the advancements in rapid prototyping and 3D printing and manufacturing, but also now with these Dynamexel product lines, you can be an, an entry novel um, early stage engineer and create these really advanced robotic solutions. So I would say really just dream big and decide that these are the requirements that you want to make and you can find your way to get there. And I would say that keep your eye out on what's changing. The When we first started designing, I always thought a big limitation was the actuators we had available to us. And then when this XC product line came out that redesigned our whole our whole robot, we were suddenly able to do a lot of the things that we couldn't do with the available actuators at the time. So kind of keeping your mind keen to what's new and also just continuing to push towards your final goal. And I, I don't really think anything's off limits at this point. Thank you very much, Samantha, for taking the time to speak with me today about this and for sharing your technology with the world. It, what you're doing is really amazing, and I'm glad that I could be even a small part of it. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for your constant assistance over this past year as we've been incorporating Dynamexel into our device.